I, as Dr. Kate Crowley, with my co-authors, Dr. Donna Valenti, Grace Sang, and Kristen Guess, we've created the Skill Building Webinar, Advanced Grammar Fundamentals for a Pluralistic Society. This is Module 1B, which continues on the fundamentals of listing and analyzing complex sentence structures. Now, we can't emphasize enough how important it is to have the knowledge of complex syntax and to have the skills on how to elicit and identify what are the complex syntax, syntactical structures the student is producing. So let's say we don't have knowledge of syntax. Can't we just depend on our standardized tests? How do our standardized tests do in assessing complex syntax? Well, let's look at one uh, test, the test of integrated language and learning skills. It includes a 26-page tutorial on grammar and T-units in the examiner's practice workbook, so the evaluators would get the enough skills to score the TILS written expression test. It's great that the authors saw that this was a need of people who are using their tests, which we know it is from that earlier research, but how many SLPs are actually going to spend the time to learn complex syntax to score this subtest? How many actually do? Would you want your surgeon to read and ha need to read an introductory tutorial on the anatomy of the heart before doing a complex uh, surgery on the heart for on you or your loved one? By this time, our language tests should build in stimuli that identify a disorder and not a language difference. And I'm sad to say that the BESA English section um, contains many, many items that focus on non-obligatory features of many varieties of American English. This is the English section I'm talking about, including African American English, Hispanized English, Jamaican English, Southern White English, Chinese influenced English, Appalachian English, and many varieties of West Indian English, including Jamaican, Bayesian, and Trinidadian English. Um, then the second part of their morphosyntactic section has students repeat sentences. And there are, there is some assessment of um, clauses, um, dependent clauses and this subordinate clauses, but how they're scored is a problem. So let me just show you. For one item is the boy who broke the window is crying. Great. The boy or a boy, they get a point. That or who, which introduces your relative clause, great. But is crying. It's the same point. You also get a point. So this is a three-point sentence. But is the, the auxiliary B form there is contractible, the boy's crying, therefore it's non-obligatory in many varieties of English. Um, look, we know that the variety of English of power and money in the United States is mainstream, general, um, standard American English. And we want kids to learn that. But our job as evaluators is not to see whether they've acquired that dialect. Our job is to see whether they have acquired the variety of English or whatever language that they've been exposed to. And if we continue to assess and score kids on whether they've acquired morpho the morphology of Brown's morphemes to, to determine whether they have a language disorder, we are mucking up our differential diagnosis between a language disorder and a language difference. Let's look at another one from the English BESA. The teacher wants to know who brought the snake. There's two points from this sentence. The student has to repeat it. The teacher uh, wants to know is one, and who who is the other? I love the who. It introduces that clause. Fantastic. Wants to know. There you have our third person singular S form, which is a non-obligatory feature of many varieties of English because it is it can be re deleted because they're of redundancy reduction. Meaning we already know it's a third person singular subject, so we don't need that S on the end to give us further information. In general American English, it is required in many varieties of English. It's fine with or without that S. How about this one? If the children make noise, they will wake up the baby. This is a four-pointer. One point for if. Fantastic. That adverbial clause, the conditional adverbial clause, great. The if, if calls it into place. If the children find they, fine, the baby, fine. So those are, you know, simple nouns and noun phrases. It, but then you have the if, it's four points, that's fine. Um, and I'd like to see more sentences like that. If you want to strengthen your knowledge of these non-obligatory features of uh, variety, features of different varieties of English, please do so on the free online course Grammar Fundamentals for a Pluralistic Society that I wrote with my co-author Chad Grossman that's on leadersproject.org. 
Well, let's look at the self. Now, there are two subtests in the self that look at complex syntax. One is the formulated sentence and the other is recalling sentences. Now, these two subtests are required across all ages. Formulated sentence, if you remember, the student is given a word and they have a picture and they have to come up with the sentence using that word that relates to that picture. Recalling sentences, they repeat the sentence verbatim. So the major flaws in the self 5 to assess complex syntax is it's not clear what's what's being assessed there. Points are taken off for inflectional, the missing inflectional morphemes. The boy, the brown dog ate all of the cat's food. If the child doesn't have apostrophe S in there, guess what? It's considered an error. But of course, that is a non-obligatory in many varieties of English. Points are taken off for weak vocabulary, such as calling a woman a girl. And there was a picture of a man and a woman. They were farming or tilling the soil. And if the child said the man and the girl, I have to say that that's not understanding how language is truly used. I work with surgeons, and when we go on our surgical uh, work internationally, um, they regularly call my graduate students girls. They are highly educated I wouldn't call them not having good vocabulary. They might need some help in understanding how to deal with, how to talk to younger women um, and how to refer to younger women, but they call them girls. They don't have weak vocabulary. Also in Spanish, chicas and niñas both can be translated as girls. Niñas means like a little girl and chicas means a girl, like a, as a there's not really a word for it in, in English, but like a young woman, you know, a young, you know, late teenage young woman. And so uh, often my friends who are from Latin America, when they speak English, they talk about the girls, but they don't have a weak vocabulary. They just have, that's consistent with their idea of what chicas means in English. How about this? Phonological errors. I flew in an airplane. So many varieties of English do not require the an airplane but it's considered wrong. Zero points if the sentences are correct but don't relate to the illustration. So say the word is although, and I make a sentence, although I appreciated the way the prosecutor made that argument, when I thought about it afterwards, I thought that it really was not justifiable giving the facts of the case. If that didn't have anything to do with the picture, I get zero points. That doesn't make any sense. If we're assessing language, are we assessing the ability, metalinguistic ability to make a sentence out of a word that doesn't have anything to do with life. And recalling sentences, points are taken off for a change, even if the meaning is not changed. For example, coach gave the, gave the trophy to the team that won the track meet. If the student changes that to who, one point is taken off. It still introduces the clause, the dependent clause. And what I appreciate about the BESA when they, when they did, you could either use who or that because it doesn't change the meaning. So there's a lot of flaws there. What does the research tell us about how to elicit and analyze complex syntax? Pavelko, Owens, Ireland, and Haas Vaughan sort of was a little embarrassment to our field. They looked at the use of language sample analysis by school-based SLPs. It was a nationwide survey. 33% of SLPs in the schools did not use language sampling. Only 45% of SLPs in middle and high schools elicited language samples. It takes too much time even though the research shows that's what you need to look at in order to assess language. Um, and uh, mostly they use conversational speech, which often does not um, get to any much complex syntax at all because it doesn't really stress the linguistic system. So we do have narratives. I used narratives for many years. I've moved away from them somewhat um, because of the cultural biases in them. But um, uh, Justice has done a lot of work, Laura Justice and her colleagues. Um, she found that growth in complex syntax didn't move much past a later elementary 10 or 11 years old because it might have been they were less interested. It might have been that that was the limitation in the, um, the kind of uh, elicitation story that they were doing. And uh, a more recent article found that there may be differences in expected story grammar across cultures. 
course, I mentioned bias. Um, one of my favorite articles is Burns, De Villiers, Pearson, and Champion from 2012. They said, let's not look at macro analysis because we really don't know best practices across cultures, but a micro analysis. Let's look at within individual sentences for elements that establish relationships between words and elements of the discourse. These authors focused on identifying referential cohesion, causal and temporal conjunctive links between elements that were used to tie clauses together. So that's what they were looking at. Um, of course, in order to do this microanalysis, evaluators need to know complex syntax. Expository, so we just talked about narrative tasks. Expository tasks in language sample elicitation were found to be very good for eliciting more complex syntax. They demonstrated growth in syntactic development through early adulthood and that differentiated between typically developing 13 year olds and those with language impairment, while a conversational task did not. This is by Marilyn Nippold and her colleagues. So um, her work shows the importance of eliciting complex language from children in assessment, especially older children and adolescents whose linguistic system will not be challenged in conversation. And similar results have been found in using persuasive language samples, meaning trying to get someone to believe a point of view that you have, and fables, a more recent article by Nipple et al. So how do we elicit narratives in expository language? Well, we've developed the SLAM materials, the school age language assessment measures, um, and I'm gonna show you them. Actually, module two and three are case studies of videos of kids using SLAM showing um, how we elicited uh, mostly expository language um, using the SLAM materials. So this is one I've been using for probably 20 years. Um, the shoe stuck between, stuck between two subway doors. What happened? How did it happen? Did this ever happen to you? What would you do if this happened to you? Um, and uh, you'll see in the videos we get great complex language and it's very expository. You have to explain what happened. How did it happen? First say, what happened? What are you seeing? How did that happen? What would you do if this happened to you? So it's a really tough, complex set, uh, syntax question at the end. Um, these are the language elicitation cards. One is Bunny Goes to School. You can see they put them in order, but it's not a sequencing test. So if they don't quite get it, I sometimes go, wait, does that go here or there? Because adults don't always get it. And then I have them tell the story. Um, then I ask questions that delve into expository language, that delve into theory of mind, that delve into perspective taking, problem solving, synthesizing, making inferences. So this is also good in looking at social and pragmatic language. That's Bunny Goes to School. Matched is Dog Comes Home. They're both for four to, through early elementary. If you want to use one for screening and one for evaluation, or you want to use one in one language, and the other in another language if the child is bilingual. Um, baseball Troubles is for older kids. It's uh, from later elementary through high school. And there's also Lost Cell Phone, um, which is also matched. These Everything is available for free at leadersproject.org. You just search SLAM and you'll find it all. Um, so this is the end of Module 1, L Fundamentals of Listening and Analyzing Complex Language Structures. Module 2 looks at kindergarten and first grade language samples, case studies of real kids, and module three looks at third and fourth grade language samples. These will be using the SLAM materials, so you'll actually be able to develop your skills in that, and then of course the assessment at the end, you'll have to demonstrate your knowledge of um, uh, that you've acquired these skills that we're hoping to build. Thank you very much.